Hello everyone. A very good afternoon and welcome to our another webinar on research ethics. So here we are continuing with the journey of our research hub. And now uh, for this session, now we are introducing our student member of research team, Ms. Nidhi Vahalia, to take over this session. Nidhi, please. Thank you so much, ma'am. So our institution, our college, is and always has been a vivacious epicenter for knowledge, innovation, and research. But why research and why is it so detrimental? So research is the key and the missing piece of, a, of the big picture that is our common future. It plays a big role in the field of education by providing a space for curious minds to inquire, ideate, and innovate independently and thus fueling growth and development. Although the process of research is an extensive one, a very, very important aspect of it is research ethics. That is exactly what today's webinar with Dr. Sneha will, be, uh, will further elaborate upon. So uh, before we begin, I would uh, request our respected principal, Dr. Ashok Wadia, to grace the webinar with his opening remarks. Thank you, Nidhi. Uh, welcome, ma'am, uh, you know, from Pune coming all the way to Mumbai and at Churchgate Jain College, uh, virtual platform at present, but I'm sure that uh, in the near future, would like to see you in the college. Itself. And then you can guide us, you know, in the way uh, which will really help our student as well as my teachers, the researchers, basically. So I'm very glad that the research hub is uh, after the you know initial uh, the opening you know it has not gone to the sleep rather they are very active and now proactive and they are uh, ensuring about it that it is going on the right direction so as the nidhi just now mentioned about um, everything you know which she has not left any words for me now so nidhi thank you so i can you know keep my speech very short because we are all here to here the Sneha Madam. But I just want to mention here that when I said right track, right track is the one when we talk about the research, knowingly or unknowingly people make mistakes. People take the things for granted or people take it because they think nobody knows about it. And today, you know, plagiarism and all those kind of words have come. People don't know like say, to what extent you can use the references and how to use it and what to take from these references. So I'm not talking about like say um, the people do it intentionally or something, but they may make a mistake. Whatever it is done, we, are, we have to keep in mind that somebody else's intellectual property is not something which we should use it without the other person's consent. And that is where what is the reference and what in context we use it in the research is very, very important. So the ethics part of it, if the person doesn't know and just carries out the research, I think somewhere it will not be the right one. As we now consider the research should be something which will be uh, addressing the social cause, the society at the large. But at the same time, when we are addressing that, it should not be something that are uh, without knowing or knowingly whichever way you can take it, that I should not be changing this particular entire process, which will harm the research itself. And because this research hub is also for the young students, Neha is the now today present on this particular forum, but there are many others who are already attending this because everyone cannot be on, on the stage as you normally have. So what I would like to say is that those, those young minds, if they learn it at this particular stage, that thin line, which is very important, and they should not cross it ever in their life, then I think that the research hub will achieve everything. And we will be, as we say, we are Jahin, salute to the nation. We want to keep and we want to ensure that we will be the torchbearer and we will set an example. And we are very happy to have among amidst us, uh, Dr. Sneha. She has the, 
I know that the people will introduce you, ma'am. But I just want to say that is the kind of uh, research and uh, her goal, and to ensure that ethics will be addressed in the right mind. So we have got the right person here. And without any ado, I would like to say that, ma'am, we are all here to hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for gracing our webinar with your presence. And on that note, I would like to hand it over to Arjuna, ma'am, to introduce our esteemed speaker, uh, Dr. Sneha Gole. Thank you, Nidhi. Um, I think Wadia sir has already uh, introduced the, the relevance of research ethics amidst us and, you know, why as faculty, as teachers and students who are dedicated to research, we have to shoulder this responsibility in a very conscious way. Uh, it's indeed our pleasure on behalf of Jai Hind College to welcome uh, the speaker for the day today on research ethics, Dr. Sneha Gole, who teaches at the Kranti Jyoti Savitri Bhai Phule Women's Studies Center um, at the Savitri Bhai uh, Phule uh, University at Pune. Her research areas are social movements with a particular focus on women's movements, gender and development, and gender and culture. She teaches papers on feminism, uh, feminist research methodology, and gender and popular culture, among others. Her other areas of engagement and research have been gender and higher education. The social history and the cultural history of Kathak, which seems very interesting, and the issue of declining child sex ratios. So it's indeed our pleasure, ma'am, to welcome you amidst us. And we are uh, very eager to hear from you and to uh, learn the pathway towards adopting a very conscious approach towards inculcating research ethics among the faculty and the students. Uh, this is an initiative of the re research hub, but I must say that the guiding spirit has been our sir behind this uh, particular whole series. And over to you, ma'am, to begin the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Professor Vadia, uh, Dr. Uh, Archana, Nidhi, all of you, uh, for having me here uh, this afternoon to talk to you all about uh, research ethics. Uh, and I think uh, Vadia sir has sort of laid out uh, why it's important to talk about uh, research. I will be, uh, I will of course talk about research ethics, but I think because I am located uh, in uh, women's studies, I'm located in gender studies, uh, I would be drawing uh, a lot from uh, feminist work on the question of uh, ethics. Uh, and so uh, a lot from the field broadly of feminist research ethics, uh, though the principles uh, that feminists have uh, sort of interrogated and intervened into uh, with respect to research have uh, a lot of bearing also uh, for research, which might not see itself as uh, as very consciously feminist. And maybe if we have the time uh, in question answers, we could talk about how we understand feminist research, because there are a lot of people who say, oh, we do research, but we don't do feminist research. Research, we do objective research. Yeah. So maybe we'll talk about all of these just ideas. Uh, also, like if to put across, just one point, humbly, I would like to put across. We have amidst us the faculty also from the sciences and from management and from commerce. So just to uh, request you to extend particularly the principles, you know, to uh, yeah. in general to everyone. Well. Yeah, no. Thanks. So I will do that. But like I said, therefore, I want to I uh, yeah. acknowledge in that sense uh, that I'm sure. drawing from uh, the field of feminist uh, research ethics. Though we would be talking sure. about uh, ethics in all kinds of research, especially uh, when we are doing research with human subjects, uh, right? Whether it is uh, in the sciences, whether it is in uh, commerce, management, social sciences, humanities. Uh, so I would uh, broadly talk about that, and I will try and uh, talk about research ethics throughout. In that sense the process of research right so whereas um, you know things like plagiarism how do we acknowledge how do we uh, reference these would be extremely important especially at the stage of writing up research uh, we will try and trace in that sense uh, what might be the ethical uh, perspective or an ethical approach uh, to research right from in that sense uh, the conceptualization of our research uh, to the process of research of data collection uh, analysis and writing up and then publication, right? So the entire, so to say, uh, arc of uh, doing research is where we I will try and, uh, you know, draw out uh, some principles, some ideas for us to, uh, you know, discuss, deliberate and uh, sort of keep in mind. Um, 
Right. Now, uh, if we actually start looking at the question of uh, ethics itself, right, um, what ethics is and whether it is in terms of research or otherwise, um, uh, it's really a question of making judgments, right? And uh, the first argument, therefore, that I want to sort of put forth uh, when we are looking at the question of research ethics uh, is that ethics is in that sense, therefore, central to the entire, to, to research. There cannot be, in that sense, a conceptualization of research that does not think about ethics, right? And I'll, I'll tell you why I, I say this, right? Now, all of us who have done any kind of research, whether it has been research for our MPhil PhD degrees uh, or, you know, minor major research projects that we might have undertaken, we all know that the process of research is a process of making decisions. Right. As researchers, we are constantly making decisions. So we start with a particular topic. Right. So, for instance, I was talking and I'm going to take that example of declining child sex ratios because it is an issue that all of us are sort of familiar with. Right. It's not uh, something that is peculiarly, uh, you know, to do only with the social sciences. It's a social question that all of us have sort of read about. Right. right. So when I decide, for instance, that I want to do some research on declining child sex mm -hmm. ratios, uh, I have to make a series of decisions to make make my topic researchable, right? And we always talk about in that sense, whenever we are presenting, whenever we write up our proposals, whether we are looking at, uh, you know, students who want to do research and are writing uh, their proposals, we always think about two questions, right? One, what is it that we are researching and how do we make it researchable? Yeah, because we all know that research um, of any kind, whether it is funded or unfunded or, you know, whether it is for a degree or whatever, uh, research always in that sense comes with a certain set of protocols, parameters and limitations, right? I mean, I would like to, for instance, if I'm doing the, uh, a study of declining child sex ratios, I would love to do, uh, you know, a survey of 20,000 people. Right. But I know that, for instance, a survey of 20,000 people would not be possible given, say, if, if it's a you know time frame of a year or, uh, you know, I don't have, say, funding from outside. I know that it's not possible. Right. So we're always in that sense when we think about research, we are constantly thinking about how do you make how do you research something and how do you make that which you want to ask? you know, ask questions to, how do you make it researchable, right? How do you scale it? Uh, how do you actually make it achievable in that sense, right? And that process, therefore, of making our research researchable uh, is, a, is, a, is a process of constantly making decisions and judgments, right? We are, we are saying, okay, so we say, okay, I'm, you know, I want to look at declining child sex ratios, but I can't look at every place. So let me look at Maharashtra, right? And then I have to think about, and that's always how we write our proposals, right? So then you have to give a rationale for why you are saying uh, Maharashtra, right? Then I'm saying, okay, Maharashtra is also too big. I can't do it. I'm going to only look at the city of Bombay. All right. So then you're going to have to look at statistics. You're going to have to look at other people who have written about it to say, why is looking at Mumbai, for instance, something that is significant? Why is it important? for instance to look at the city of Mumbai then we would say okay how am I going to look at the city of Mumbai so one way of doing that could be you know and, and if somebody is say an economist or a statistician they would say I'm going to look at census data and I'm going to maybe look at you know ward wise data uh, uh, you know and, and try and see which are the wards which have good uh, numbers which wards have bad numbers within that what are the sections which whatever right if I'm say uh, somebody who is uh, you know say maybe from the health sciences I might want to know for instance is there a relationship relationship between, say, the number of sonography clinics in a particular area and their, uh, you know, uh, uh, whatever, their child sex ratios. And therefore, uh, can I work, for instance, uh, with, with uh, you know, doctors who are in those sonography clinics to try and, you know, sort of understand what is their perspective. If I'm from sociology, I might want to know, for instance, what is the class and caste background that makes up these different wards? And do you see any pattern, uh, you know, differential pattern depending on uh, the location of the families or their or their backgrounds or so, social backgrounds, so on, right? So depending on, in that sense, which disciplines we come from, uh, what is it that we are interested in, we always try and break down uh, our question, which is a large research question, into researchable parts, right? Uh, and this this is therefore a process that involves continuously making judgments and making decisions. 
right? We are constantly making decisions and judgments. We are saying, okay, this is something I'm going to look at. This is something I'm going to sort of skip. I'm going to, uh, you know, delimit. Uh, I'm going to only look at this and not look at that, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? And I'm saying that uh, in that sense, if we understand ethics or generally moral theory, as it is called, uh, that ethics is really about making judgments, right? Especially in that sense, making judgments which are informed by some kind of an explicit framework. And therefore, if we understand the process of research also in that sense as a process of constantly making decisions and making judgments uh, towards the best output in that sense, best research output, then I'm saying that ethics is central to the way in which we, we should be thinking about the question of research, right? So you cannot actually think of research outside of. And often what happens is uh, when we think of feminist uh, or when we think of generally also research ethics, uh, we always think that research ethics is something that is extraneous to research, right? So we, we think up our research, we have our proposal, and then uh, because now it is mandated, we have to go and get, uh, you know, sanction from the ethics committee. Or when it comes to the point of... Uh, uh, say publication, then we start thinking about questions like plagiarism, or we start thinking about you know uh, questions like uh, you know are we are we in that sense uh, repeating um, you know is this going to be a problem? Uh, but as if you know you can do research without thinking about ethical questions at every step, right? We often think of ethics as only coming in one at the level of maybe you know where you need to get a grant or you need to get a whatever where you need to get uh, you know the ethical committee has to pass your proposal. Proposal, or then we think of ethics as something that comes into play when we have to actually output our research in terms of writing it or publishing it or whatever, right? And therefore, the first point that I want to make, the first submission, uh, in a sense, that I want to make uh, about the question of research ethics uh, is that ethics is about, in that sense, making judgments, uh, as is research. And therefore, research and ethics, you cannot think of research outside of ethics. It is in many ways intrinsic, therefore, uh, to to the whole process in that sense or in that sense to the whole um, the whole trajectory uh, as it were of uh, you know of, of doing research yeah hello yeah so that's that's the first thing right now the second thing that i want to therefore uh, you know sort of put out is that uh, ethics therefore is about uh, the responsible conduct of research okay uh, it is about so so ethics uh, therefore not only as i said at the level of publishing uh, but right from the question of identifying what it is that we are trying to research from that moment onwards in a sense uh, it is about therefore the process of it is about how do we conduct our research in an ethical uh, sort of a manner right and uh, here therefore when uh, and i want to make a distinction in a sense between uh, moral and ethical because moral uh, seems to presuppose a certain normative uh, sort of an understanding of what is and what should be or should not be. Uh, whereas when I'm talking about ethics, uh, I'm saying that ethics are therefore, I'm, I'm distinguishing them in that sense from morality uh, because I'm saying that ethical, being ethical is contextual, being ethical is therefore a process, being ethical therefore is something that happens in at every step of doing research right so there are in that sense that will be therefore and we will talk about them certain signposts of how we can think about what responsible ethical research should look like uh, but there isn't a normative list of do's and don'ts uh, okay let me give you let me give you an example uh, to illustrate what i mean by this right so for instance uh, a lot of times um, we are often told uh, that, uh, uh, you know, one of the ethical things to do when you do research uh, is to maintain, in that sense, the confidentiality of your participant right uh, in terms of whatever anonymization uh, you know uh, of their names when they appear or whatever whatever right i mean that's that's something that's always told to us as something that is <coughs> a, a principle uh, ethical principle that we must follow when we are doing research yeah 
Now, a lot of researchers, especially those um, you know who have been working, for instance, with uh, you know with with groups which have been say marginalized, or who have worked in that sense with groups uh, you know who have found themselves written out from say uh, you know the history uh, uh, of the world, for instance, uh, or who have been written out in that sense from narratives of particular kinds of uh, you know so people who have been at the margin say of educational institutions or people who have been uh, in that sense in the margins of society uh, many of them have actually argued that uh, they don't want to be anonymized okay that they would in fact uh, they that 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 dignity in research would be if they are represented uh, in the outcome of the research as they are right so uh, in us and therefore we cannot even i mean i'm not therefore saying that oh uh, you know confidentiality is not the principle uh, you know whatever uh, that you must reveal their names or their identities is the principle no the point that i'm trying to make therefore is what would constitute ethical responsible research uh, is a highly contextual matter right uh, and that therefore it is a practice that the researcher has to arrive at uh, through extremely sensitive and responsive uh, dialogue with their participants right uh, and and in that also it's always in that sense very very tricky right so the participants might want to be say identified but as a researcher you can see for instance uh, that uh, you know revealing for instance their identity would put them in harm's way right so what do you do in that case now there could be many different ways of thinking about it one could be for instance asking participants if they would like to and and you know uh, talking to them about why for instance uh, you know revealing their identity in the research output might not be possible uh, but then giving them probably the option of uh, choosing the the the, the nickname uh, or the pseudonym uh, by which they would like to be known when they are represented in research for instance right i mean and I'm, again i'm not saying that this is the normative solution what i'm trying to say is that what constitutes ethically and which is why i'm making that distinction between moral moral judgments and ethical conduct uh, because morality often works on uh, you know um, uh, in that sense explicit constants right morality often works on very black and white ideas of good and bad uh, correct and incorrect right and therefore i'm making a uh, making a distinction where i'm saying that what we are seeking to do therefore is not moral judgments but rather ethical conduct right and therefore what would constitute a principle of ethical conduct of research uh, would be something that would be highly uh, in that sense um, you know highly in that sense contextual right uh, for instance sometimes especially when researchers have studied up right so uh, within uh, uh, re, you know within uh, uh, research and this has been of course something where uh, especially uh, social science research has brought in a lot of insights right uh, where they have tried to look at what is the relationship between the researcher and the research what is the positionalities that the researcher and the research for instance have what is the power relation that exists between the researcher and the research right uh, often and and now of course a lot of critical science studies uh, are also pointing out to the fact that this idea of scientific research for instance is something that is entirely uh, objective value neutral uh, is actually uh, uh, not true right uh, i mean for instance there's a very very uh, you know uh, uh, very i mean i always find that article very useful to think about uh, the way in which we can also critically look at for instance science uh, research uh, there is this work uh, by uh, by uh, you know uh, um, a woman called emily martin um, yeah and it's called um, it's called the egg and the sperm the making of a scientific fairy tale okay uh, and interestingly what emily martin uh, does is she actually looks at the uh, you know what appears in our science textbooks uh, as the story of fertilization of human fertilization right and all of us are familiar uh, with that story we've all learned it in 8th uh, standard 9th standard biology textbooks uh, where you know this egg comes from the fallopian tube and comes and sits in the uh, in the uterus and then you know you have these thousands of uh, uh, you know, sperms which sort of fight their way through the vaginal canal and they enter the uterus, and then one brave uh, sperm is finally able to, you know, sort of uh, 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 penetrate the egg and fertilize it, right? 
uh, and that's the story. That's always how that story is told to us, right? And Emily Martin very interestingly actually shows us how the way that story is narrated to us uh, is actually at odds or the way in which that story is told to us as scientific knowledge about human reproduction in our science textbooks uh, is actually at odds with what we observe in, uh, you know, scientific labs uh, where more and more research is now actually showing us that it's not, uh, you know, the sperm as this, you know, some prince who has come to uh, save the sleeping beauty egg, you know, who gives her the kiss of love and uh, makes the egg come alive, but rather that the egg and the sperm are actually involved in a much more mutual process where the egg also uh, you know plays a role in choosing which sperm it would want uh, to mate with for instance and so on right and actually therefore she uh, she shows us uh, and, and and she draws in that sense from scientific uh, research to show us uh, that the process of human fertilization is actually a much more mutual reciprocal and equal uh, sort of a process between the egg and the sperm uh, and therefore she argues that much, I mean, much more than uh, what actually happens, uh, what constructs this, this story of how human fertilization occurs uh, is our assumptions about the masculine and the feminine elements, right? So she says that, you know, if you look at the description of what happens to the egg and the sperm in our science textbooks, the egg behaves like a coy sleeping beauty princess, right? Whereas the sperm seems to behave like this knight in shining armor. And she says, actually, uh, it has much more to do with our social constructions of masculinity and feminine femininity rather than actually what really so to say what really uh you know uh you know happens right uh and so she is saying therefore that i mean like for instance she asks a very simple question uh you know she says the the egg is not female right the egg is found in the female body the egg has no gender uh and the sperm is not male the sperm is found in the male body but we uh, you know, assume the egg to be female and the sperm to be male and actually superimpose onto the process our own understandings actually of masculinity and femininity that allows us to, uh, that, you know, stops us actually from telling the story of human fertilization as a story of mutuality, cooperation and equality, which it actually is. Uh, and, and, and rather than as the story of this, you know, almost, uh, uh, you know, forceful penetration of the sperm, uh, uh, you know, into the egg and so on right and so what all i'm therefore trying to uh, sort of point out um is that, uh, you know, whatever be uh, the research that we are doing, right? Sometimes we feel that because, uh, especially in scientific research, we feel that because we are not dealing with human subjects, uh, questions, for instance, of gender, the way in which social construction of knowledge happens, etc., does not actually influence or does not have any role to play in the ways in which we do research, right? And therefore, my point is that uh, we have to be so when we are thinking then of what it means to do ethical research, uh, one of the first things, therefore, that we need to think about is ask ourselves, where do our questions, for instance, come from? Why is it that we find certain questions researchable? How do we go about finding them? And what might be our own understandings of the world around us, which are shaped by actually, uh, you know, the way in which society constructs our ideas? How does that actually influence the ways in which we construct knowledge because if what is research finally right at its very basic if we understand research as a process of creating knowledge right that's what we are all trying to do we are trying to create new knowledge through research or we are trying to challenge existing knowledges we are trying to uh you know course correct existing knowledges to say okay they tell us so much but not uh, beyond that so if research is a process then of creation of knowledge, then one of the first questions that we need to ask when we are talking about ethical research or ethics in research is to ask questions about that knowledge itself. And where does that knowledge come from? What cons gets constructed as knowledge? How do we decide that something is knowledge? How do we decide that something is, uh, you know, important enough, for instance, to be, uh, you know, to be studied? Uh, we need to therefore ask fundamental questions about, uh, you know, what, uh, so very interestingly, uh, uh, you know, Harding, uh, uh, a feminist scholar, she says that we, we always think of research in two contexts, right? Uh, we think of research in the, in, in, in the context of something called the context of justification. And we should also think of research, she says, in something called the context of discovery, okay? 
<coughs> now, <coughs> what is the context of justification? That is how we usually judge whether research is good research or uh, or research is uh, you know justified research or or research is ethical research right which is what which is to say that okay if this is the conclusion for instance that i have come to have i followed all the steps or all the principles of research uh, therefore is my conclusion justified by my uh, data right we often so we would say for instance you know if you take whatever if you take uh, 100 uh, people and you try and track them say in terms of uh, whatever right their possibility of getting say heart attack and what is their diet right and of these 100 people uh, you know you find whatever people with say high fat diet uh, 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 you know 50 of them had high fat diet and 40 of them got a heart attack 50 of them uh, did not have a, a high fat diet and only 10 of them got a heart attack and then you therefore conclude that you know there is a link between high fat diet and heart attacks for instance right uh, and we often when we think about ethics or ethical research we only look at this idea of the context of justification Okay. Now, within this context of justification also, uh, there are many kinds of ethical questions that we need to ask. Uh, and and, and, and I, again, I'm not taking these examples out of the hat, right? I'm also taking these examples in a sense uh, from the history of, uh, you know, science, scientific research and, and creation in that sense of scientific knowledges, right? Uh, so for the longest time, uh, you know, a lot of medical research that happened, uh, and especially, for instance, with coronary heart diseases, with heart diseases, a lot of the research that actually happened, uh, this, act, this happened only with male subjects, Okay. So uh, all the people who are in, you know, included in that sense in research, which tried to find out what are the possible, what are the factors that might, uh, you know, uh, make you more, uh, more post probable uh, for having a heart attack, for instance, um, uh, looked at uh, all the subjects for men, right? And but when the research findings were published, this was assumed to be true for all human beings right so what was actually research that was done with male subjects and again male subjects of a certain race for the most part white men um, was then uh, used to create either parameters or ways of understanding what are the trigger factors of heart attacks for all human beings right you can already i'm sure start seeing what the problem with that sort of a uh, methodology is right and we do know i mean and now we know you know as as scientific research has looked into these questions uh, as the subjects with whom we work uh, have been diversified as many of these uh, you know research findings have been revisited uh, in the context of a more diverse inclusive sort of set of human subjects uh, we know in fact that you know men for instance are more likely uh, with the same kind of con you know uh, context they are actually more likely to have heart disease than women etc 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 right but we know that only because we have gone back to looking at who is it that we are studying and how is it that we sort of make a generalizations on the basis of that study right uh, and for the most part i mean often we see so um, you know it's a very interesting idea again right whatever um, you know your bmi indicators right fat what is ideal percentage of fat for instance right many of these parameters which decide what are average heights average weight average whatever uh, a very big question a very crucial question uh, within that then is what is the composition of the sample right and for the longest time uh, it was assumed uh, that you know if it, it doesn't really matter in scientific research what is for instance the nature of the sample uh, right. And so you have routinely had in the history of science uh, experiments or observations being conducted uh, about in that sense, the, uh, you know, about all male subjects, uh, which have then been generalized to be true. So, quote unquote, true for all human beings. Uh, and we see, of course, that that is a problem. Right. Now, this is only we are only looking at the or at the context of justification. So within, in that sense, the universe of that particular research, we are asking questions. We're saying basically also, therefore, the argument that many of many uh, scholars have made uh, is that simply if you're going to try and do a research on what uh, what is the link between, say, you know, high fat food and uh, and heart disease, 
and you're only going to study 100 white men, it's just bad science, right? It's simply bad science, uh, right? And so that you need to therefore revisit this research uh, in terms of what is the composition of that, etc. right? So this is therefore about the context of justification. So within the universe of that study itself or that research itself, uh, what actually constitutes good research practice, right? That's really what we are in that sense, trying to, um, uh, trying to in that sense, uh, challenge or trying to uh, nuance, yeah? Going beyond this, uh, when we're looking at the question of ethics then, is the question then of the context of discovery, okay? And the question of the context of discovery is really therefore a question of what is it that we find, for instance, researchable, okay? And again, let me give you, let me give you another example, uh, you know, to, to sort of qualify what I mean by that. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, many, many, uh, uh, you know, scholars who work, for instance, in the pharmaceutical industry, who work, uh, you know, in the biological sciences, for instance, have asked this question, right? Uh, then why is it and how is it? So who uh, or what kind of diseases get funding uh, for R&D uh, in terms of, uh, you know, scientific research, right? Uh, and so, for instance, they've asked the question, why is it that something like menstrual pain, for instance, which afflicts a large number of humanity, I mean, 50% uh, of humanity and within that a large percentage uh, of them. Why is it that actually there is no, uh, there has actually been no uh, concerted uh, research or any sort of, so what you basically have for menstrual pain is painkillers, but there has been actually no research on trying to find out why that happens, uh, right? Versus say something like uh, whatever, for instance, premature ejaculation, and then you have the virus and so on. Right? The question again is not therefore to say whether you know that research should not happen or this research should happen, but to ask the question, how does something come to be seen as researchable? Uh, what are therefore in that sense the relationships of power uh, which are implicated in that sense, uh, you know, in the context of what becomes researchable or what comes to be seen in that sense uh, as researchable, right? Uh, and therefore I'm saying that when we are looking at the question of uh, you know, ethics, for instance, uh, we need to begin by looking at or asking in that sense, uh, the question of what is research. Uh, and this is a question, therefore, also for us, uh, you know, as, as individual, so, so to say, uh, you know, uh, individual uh, researchers, to ask the question in terms of the ethics of, to put it very, 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 you know, uh, simply, to ask the question about the ethics of your research purpose. That's what I mean, right? So um, uh, ethics, therefore, uh, in a sense, has to begin by asking questions about the ethics of the research purpose in terms of saying, what is the value of conducting this research? What is the value of conducting this research with, say, human subjects? Uh, you know, uh, why should we, uh, you know, actually, should do we really, in that sense, uh, you know, need to do this research, for instance, with uh, with human subjects, um, uh, and 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 you know, then think about in that sense, uh, how do we go about uh, doing it, right? Uh, so so you know, the question of their knowledge over ignorance, uh, for instance, the question of uh, you know, trying to understand, for instance, nature, um, uh, or or uh, you know, is there in that sense an intrinsic value? Uh, to knowledge, right? And and so uh, in some ways also the question of ethics, uh, of research ethics is then also closely tied up to the question of, uh, you know, what is in that sense the, uh, you know, what is in that sense um, uh, the 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 the, uh, the value of knowledge itself, right? What does uh, uh, you know uh, uh, knowledge allow us to do? Can knowledge be liberating? What kind of knowledge is uh, uh, you know is freeing? Is 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 in that sense uh, liberating? Uh, and therefore, to ask the question uh, to ourselves that when we are doing some research, any research, whether it is in the uh, natural sciences or whether it is in the social sciences or whatever, uh, does this uh, you know does this research uh, contribute or create knowledge that is in some ways uh, freeing, empowering, um, you know, uh, liberating in that sense for, uh, you know, human uh, sort of uh, sort of race, right? Uh, so, so therefore, uh, 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 you know, in a, in a sense, it begins from asking the question of what is the ethical purpose uh, of the inquirer, right? I mean, whose interests in that sense uh, are we, uh, you know, are we, uh, um, are we, uh, 
uh, really uh, fulfilling in the process of doing uh, research? Uh, whose need is it to find answers to these questions? Um, how do we align in that sense, maybe our own need as a researcher to find answers to particular questions uh, with the, uh, you know, with the, uh, in that sense, um, uh, you know, with, 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 in that sense, uh, the participants, right? And so a lot of, the, uh, one of the things that has actually come up, uh, uh, you know, as a way of thinking through, in that sense, this question uh, of, uh, uh, you know, of, uh, the purpose of, ethical, uh, uh, you know, the, the ethics of purpose in that sense uh, is really therefore also about doing uh, what has been called participatory or collaborative uh, kind of work, right? Yeah. Where you you uh, you know think about your uh, the people that you do research with, not therefore as respondents as we have always traditionally thought of uh, in research terms. Now that we are the we are the researchers and they are our respondents, those who respond, uh, but rather as participants, right? Uh, as and, and therefore uh, the process of research not as a singular process of making knowledges. Uh, you know, that the researcher in that sense is interested in, uh, but rather actually looking at it as a space or as a place of collaborative uh, knowledge making, right? Where you are in that sense uh, uh, involved in a process of making knowledges together along with, in that sense, uh, your participants, right? And this would then mean that, you know, participants have to be included in the uh, formulation, in the planning, in the conduct, as well as in that sense, uh, you know, in the in the analysis uh, of uh, this work, right? Uh, and so this could be in terms of, you know, action research. Uh, sometimes it has been in the context of, uh, you know, different kinds of participatory research where uh, either, uh, uh, you know, the analysis is done together by the researcher and uh, the participants uh, or by building in mechanisms, for instance, of, uh, you know, uh, so you don't in that sense go out and uh, publish what you think is the, uh, the without actually having a process of dialogue and uh, you know uh, presenting what you think you have learned to the community and 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 you know finding some way of also getting uh, their perspectives into it right now this brings us also to a very very um, uh, you know big question right uh, which is also then the question of what happens as if as a researcher your understanding of something is different from how the participants see it right and therefore if your it's also your responsibility in that sense as a researcher to create new knowledges. Now, how do you see this sort of, you know, how do you actually solve this kind of a dilemma where you might actually think or you are interpreting the data as something different and your research participants actually see it as uh, different, right? And uh, and that brings into question also the very, very, uh, you know, difficult question uh, of the power of the researcher, right? Because finally, in that sense, we all know that, um, you know, uh, researchers located as we are in the academia, as you know, with our access in that sense to journals or other avenues of writing, finally, we are the ones who represent the field, right? In our writing, finally, we are the ones who decide what the field looks like. Uh, and so therefore, the big question, uh, which is very, very tricky when it comes to, uh, you know, the ethics of research, uh, is how do we uh, look at a situation in which I, as a researcher, might see something differently uh, than how the participants view, for instance, their own life. Right. Or their own uh, interactions or their own actions or whatever. Uh, now, again, there is no prescriptive one way, normative way of seeing this. Right. Uh, but there, but again, researchers have tried to find many different ways of negotiating with this. Right. So there is a very interesting work, for instance, uh, by this uh, scholar called Catherine Borland. Uh, you know, and Catherine Borland, um, actually, um, uh, she did a, a detailed life narrative interview, oral history interview uh, with her grandmother. OK, uh, to try and understand what women's lives, say, 1960s America looked like. OK, uh, and, uh, you know, her, her her grandmother gives her a very detailed account of her, uh, you know, of her life. Uh, now, Catherine Bolin, when she's reading her uh, her her uh, grandmother's narrative, uh, she sees her uh, she sees her grandmother as a feminist. Uh, right. She thinks her, her, her grandmother was feminist uh, that, you know, her uh, uh, father. So her gra great grandfather, her grandmother's father was actually trying to limit her, uh, was trying to push her into feminine roles and how she resisted and, you know, 
uh, how she was an early feminist, etc. Right now, when Borland uh, writes up this story of her grandmother's along with her analysis of it and shows it to her grandmother, her grandmother is completely she's aghast. She says, "What nonsense is this? What have you done with my story? This is not uh, what I said. This is not my story. I am not some feminist. My father was not some tyrant. What is this?" Uh, you know, I completely disagree uh, with what you have written about my life, right? And Catherine Borland talks about this great dilemma then. She says, because I know that as a researcher with my own, uh, you know, training, my own uh, framework, I know that, you know, this is what I want to say about her life. But that is not what she wants uh, said about her life. And then what do I do? And so Catherine Borland does something very interesting. Uh, you know, she uh, writes up actually the interview uh, as a transcript right as it was said and then she presents to the reader two different so she presents her analysis of that transcript and she also writes what her grandmother has had to say about uh, that transcript and she says and 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 you know she contextualizes it by giving uh, you know, talking about who she is, how did she come to this research question? Why does she think, uh, you know, that 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 transcript should be read like this, uh, as well as contextualizing her grandmother, and therefore leaves it in that sense to us as readers to uh, accept or whatever which version or which analysis or which interpretation in that sense of that story uh, we would like to, um, uh, you know, sort of take up. Right now, this is of course not uh, something that is always possible, right? I mean, and, and researchers have done many things, you know, sometimes they have uh, because it's also, uh, you know, crucially a question of uh, is this going to, in some way, your interpretation or your understanding, is this going to, in some way, harm the community, the participants that you have worked with, right? Uh, and therefore, sometimes, uh, you know, researchers sort of have also taken a step back from their own analysis uh, to sort of say that, you know, this is not the moment at which we are going to, uh, you know, put out this analysis because it might have uh, negative repercussions, but we will find other ways in that sense of uh, doing that, right? Uh, so one of therefore, uh, you know, from, so, so we move therefore from looking at the question of the purpose of research, then to the conduct of research, right? And all of these questions, uh, therefore, are central to the way in which we conduct research and how then we analyze in that sense uh, and present uh, research. Um, Arshan, I'm sorry, I should, we have another, can I go on for another? Like yeah, five? yeah, you can. Uh, so I was just requesting you to also touch upon uh, particularly the, the aspects of plagiarism and how to avoid that. And yeah. also uh, on collaborative research between faculty and uh, also when you're taking interdisciplinary research projects, how uh, how is this uh, research ethics to be kept in mind by both the researchers as a community when they are coming together and also with regard to whatever they are researching? Right. You could right. highlight on that as well. Yeah. Right, right. No, I think, yeah. So in terms of, like I was saying, in terms of collaborative uh, research, some of these principles of what would be true for uh, participatory research would also be true for collaborative research, uh, which might be interdisciplinary, uh, oftentimes, which might also be between faculty, uh, you know, members uh, who might be differently located within the power hierarchy also of uh, institutions, right? So, and, and all of our uh, research uh, ecosystems have these kinds of uh, distinctions of the principal, the principal investigator, the co-investigator, uh, so on and so forth, right? So I think it's crucial just as we think about the relationships in that sense between participants and researchers. Uh, I think some of those principles of reciprocity, uh, of transparency, uh, of honesty, of, uh, you know, giving space for different interpretations and different understandings, uh, which would hold true for the relationship between researchers and participants, uh, would also also actually be principles to sort of bring into uh, you know being when we are thinking about collaborative research between uh, researchers across either disciplines or across institutions or across hierarchies uh, right because uh, within researchers also in that sense uh, especially when we are coming from different disciplinary backgrounds uh, we are coming with very different uh, you know training and methodologies for instance uh, we are coming uh, you know with very different focus uh, 
you know, which would which would differ in that sense from our disciplinary locations. Uh, when we're bringing it together, especially when we're doing interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary sort of research, uh, I think these principles of transparency, honesty, giving, uh, you know, equal voice to different uh, perspectives, different understandings, uh, different interpretations uh, would actually be central for any kind of collaborative uh, work. I think the second very, very important question of ethics uh, is the question of difference. Right. Whether we are looking at the question of uh, difference uh, between participants and researchers or within researchers themselves. Right. Uh, how do we then deal with the question uh, of difference? Because we will always in that sense and difference, not only as diversity or variety, but difference also in terms of a lot of times uh, power differentials and hierarchies. Right. Uh, so the question of how do we negotiate difference, uh, both in terms of, you know, our different locations, our different power, but also our difference in terms of how we understand questions, how we interpret questions, uh, that has to be, I think, in many ways central to our research process. And a lot of times, you know, um, we tend to, when we are, especially when we are doing this sort of uh, collaborative research, uh, we feel that, uh, you know, differences or thrashing out in that sense, uh, you know, how we interpret or see things differently uh, is a waste of time, is inefficient. It takes away, uh, you know, if we are not able to give one one single sort of interpretation and a single concrete uh, conclusion, uh, then it's actually taking away from the efficacy of our research. Uh, and therefore, a lot of times when we are doing collaborative work of this kind, uh, we tend to try and homogenize actually, uh, uh, you know, research findings or perspectives uh, and oftentimes those who are more powerful within that grid uh, then tend to have the say in terms of what actually gets written in the report uh, or what actually gets uh, sort of put out. Uh, and therefore, a part also thinking about research ethics is to is to also see the fact that, uh, you know, the process of knowledge production will be a complex process uh, that actually good research is not about bringing out, uh, you know, some sort of con just one concrete conclusion, but also learn Learning may be new ways of asking questions. Uh, you know, even learning may be new ways of approaching a topic that has, uh, about which there is a certain, uh, you know, canonical knowledge that has been established. Or just opening out existing knowledge to new questions is also good research, right? So good research is not always uh, or necessarily to be seen in terms of finding one concrete uh, inference. And and or oftentimes when we do collaborative research, when research is not a singular uh, process, process, we oftentimes will end up with more complicated, more complex maybe questions than what we started off with uh, without a single kind of an answer. Uh, and I think a process, a, a very important part of thinking about research ethics is also therefore rethinking what does our idea of good research, what is our idea of good research, uh, right? Uh, and, and, and therefore, in a sense, as we said that, you know, moving away from this idea that research is about being able to give one single concrete unequivocal sort of an answer to the question, uh, but rather to make, you know, even complicating a question, uh, even opening out descriptions of complex phenomenon, giving good descriptions of complex phenomenon is also good research, right? So I think one of the parts, therefore, of ethical research, especially when we look at it in, uh, you know, interdisciplinary collaborative sort of context is to also, therefore, rethink uh, the question of what do we see as good research? And do we try and therefore uh, force uh, you know, actually what are what are complex and, uh, you know, multiple observations, uh, multiple in that sense, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 kinds of whatever um, uh, insights that we might have uh, into some sort of a singular, uh, you know, inference, right? Uh, and I think that's one way to think about the question of ethics uh, when it comes to collaborative uh, whatever work. Um, just turning very quickly then to the question of uh, plagiarism. Um, um, I think that uh, we need to be very, very uh, careful about the question of plagiarism. Uh, not, uh, and we again often approach the question of plagiarism as a technical question, right? Uh, so we'll say, oh, uh, is is it ten percent or? 
eleven percent or twelve percent or thirteen percent or whatever, right? Uh, and of course, uh, you know, our our again, our research ecosystems force us to think about it in these percent terms because you know you have to put it through that search engine and you know have, you have to generate a report that says it's less than whatever or more than whatever. But I think the question of plagiarism is also in that sense a deeply ethical question because it again goes back to how is it that we understand the process of knowledge making right uh, and one of the ways also of thinking about knowledge making as an ethical practice uh, is to understand that knowledge making is always an incremental process right so nobody i mean in that sense we always draw from existing uh, sources and we are building on in that sense existing knowledges uh, but there is therefore a very clear cut line between knowing existing sources and copying existing sources uh, and 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 i think therefore if you are engaging with the knowledge that exists in your field uh, you are engaging with it methodologically and i think that is where uh, you know plagiarism we really need to think of the question of plagiarism like that uh, we often uh, engage with the material that has been produced within our uh, you know sphere or whatever it is that we are researching uh, only in content terms uh, only in terms of seeing who has made what argument and we often think that you know producing one after the other the eight important arguments that have been made and then saying how we differ from that is actually what uh, you know uh, uh, research review or, or or you know beginning research is right uh, but i'm saying that if you we engage with the existing knowledges in our field not just in terms of reproducing their arguments but through method methodologically to therefore think of review as method uh, right review not therefore just as a collection of what exists but review as actually method where you are engaging with what has gone in terms of trying to understand what is it saying how is it saying it what is the evidence that it is giving and is that evidence actually supporting the kind of conclusion that has been drawn if we approach each of the material that we are looking at methodologically rather than only in terms of what is the argument uh, and then try and think about what is it that we are trying to do in our research the way in which we report that also automatically changes right because you don't uh, uh, once you start engaging with this material methodologically uh, you can never repro you can never copy paste the original because what you are doing is you are actually asked trying to make sense of what is it that it is saying and uh, why right in if there are points at which you know there is a particular line or there's a particular phrase there's a particular way in which uh, this author has put it and you think that it's absolutely essential uh, you know for anyone reading to understand what is being said only through that phrase then just that phrase you sort of you know copy paste and you uh, you know you give a proper reference there saying this is not your idea so the idea of really referencing again we look at referencing as a very technical thing oh likke rakho kahan se liya hai wo dalna hota hai right uh, if we don't think of uh, you know ref, uh, of of referencing as this technical thing but rather simply as a process of acknowledging what we have learned from whom right uh, not as this technical need of uh, oh you know we need to quote people we need to tell where we have quoted whom from but simply as we would do in in everyday life right if in everyday life you learn uh, a word from someone or you learn a particular way of doing something from someone don't we acknowledge that don't we say when someone looks at your handwriting and says oh it's really nice don't we very easily say oh that's thanks to my third grade teacher who made me whatever right don't we acknowledge what we learned from whom in our everyday life if we think of referencing therefore not as a technical requirement but simply Simply as the ethical practice of actually owning up where we know what we know comes from, right? It's actually just the ethical practice of acknowledging and saying thank you to those whom we have learned something from. And because you are doing it in writing, you do it. You can't say write a line there. I thank uh, Gail Omwit for giving me this insight. So you. write the insight and you know you put a bracket there and you say i learned this from omwet 1990 it's it's just that right referencing is just that it is just a way of saying thank you acknowledging 
what we have learned and if we therefore understand that knowledge is about incremental it's an incremental process that nobody come you know nobody does anything um, in that sense original so to say in the sense that you know something that has never been done before uh, and that we are always all of us are actually a collaborative community uh, talking to each other disagreeing agreeing uh, questioning challenging in order to build a better knowledge of our world if we see that process as a collaborative uh, incremental process uh, then we would not have so much problems with acknowledging where we've learned what we've learned from and where we are taking that uh, learning from so I, I believe that i mean you know I, 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 there, i'm sure there are the many many people who will give you the technical tools of how to check for plagiarism right I, you can go on the internet and find them but i think what is important more important uh, than that technical tool of you know how much plagiarism or uh, you know thinking again of referencing as technical is to change our perspective on how do we look at that question uh, and i think we need to look at that question in terms of again fundamentally how we understand the process of knowledge making and knowledge building uh, and therefore do we see knowledge building do we see the process of research as a fundamentally ethical uh, process as a fundamentally ethical practice and if we think of it as an ethical practice uh, then it is only in that sense a life skill right where you say thank you to those you have learned from and you acknowledge what you have learned uh, from them and i think referencing uh, is just that we need to think of referencing as a way of saying i know what i know about this topic because one two three four five six seven have said this and i have learned from them and i want to add this ninth thing to it Right. Uh, so I think that's what I want would want to say about uh, the question. Just of one question from my system. side, and then we open the floor for the questions. A few questions we have to take. Uh, yeah, so sure. how is the question of research ethics related to the safety aspect, the safety of uh, of the people about whom we research, and also about uh, uh, in general, about humanity, how is it concerned with the questions of uh, safety? Just a few lines on that, if you could speak up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for that question. So um, I think one of the, I mean, and that is, uh, you know, in that sense, considered um, the most principle, the most crucial sort of uh, ethics in uh, research, which is what is called the principle of do no harm. Right. That um, um, and 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 it's again closely tied up also to the question of what do we do uh, as researchers, right? So the idea is that no matter uh, you know what, if you cannot bring about any kind of positive change in the participants you're working with, the least you can do is to make sure that you do not do any harm to them, right? And therefore, all of these questions, right? So uh, for instance, keeping uh, their confidentiality intact, wherever they are saying uh, sensitive things, things which might bring them, uh, you know, get them into trouble, say with uh, those who are in position of power, uh, which might, uh, uh, you know, lead them uh, to be further exploited or further violated. Uh, we need to be extremely careful about how do we go about, uh, you know, dealing with these kinds of, uh, eh? which is why confidentiality becomes very crucial, especially when we are reporting, uh, you know, this, when we are writing it up, uh, it becomes extremely important. But like I said, therefore, it has to, we have to always balance in that sense, this question of what is for the quote unquote best or better, uh, uh, you know, for our uh, sort of participants. Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay. Yeah, so I was just therefore saying that um, no. So this question of safety therefore is very very uh, crucial, and uh, it has to again. It has to be about therefore also uh, rethinking sometimes, right? I mean, often we uh, we go into the field thinking we want to ask one, two, three, four, five, uh, but we also need to be sensitive to the fact sometimes that uh, you know certain questions which might be important to us as researchers might actually put our participants in jeopardy, right? And that we have to therefore back out. Uh, uh, from asking some of these uh, questions because again the que 
see the point is and like i was saying um, the question of feminist uh, of of ethics and research is also about seeing um, the fact that research cannot only be about the researcher right that we often put ourselves as the researchers at the center and we say oh i need to know this uh, without asking enough questions about what does my need to know this mean for the people that i am uh, sort of working with right so do no harm uh, uh, you know would in that sense be the first principle uh, of any research uh, of any kind of research because uh, often times what we how our participants will benefit from this research uh, could actually be very very vague sometimes not at all uh, right a lot of times uh, they don't have any direct material or any other kinds of benefits from being a part of this research but we need to there ensure that they are in no way harmed uh, or put in any sort of negative jeopardy because of the research in a sense that we are uh, you know that we are doing and therefore thinking about ethics in terms of our research purpose not just in terms of our research conduct and the way in which we write up research i think but from our research purpose i mean sometimes you really need to also ask yourself uh, and often you know when we are college students or we are just starting off research uh, we always want to do research in what we think is exciting areas right i mean we were just talking to our students uh, so we are doing something um, uh, you know a research project at the at the center mm. Uh, which involves marginalized vulnerable communities and all our students were like oh we want to go to the uh, sex workers field work and we were asking them why do you want to go that because that looks seems exciting and we have to really ask ourselves do we need to go and speak to you know human subjects or do we need to speak to these people uh, in order to actually find what we need to find right often times so we have to first begin by asking the question does my research purpose really require me to work with human subjects and i think we need to begin the question of ethics from that uh, you know that sort of uh, moment right so um who's going to take the questions nidhi uh, yeah yeah we both will be taking the questions so um, thank you so much for such an insightful session ma'am I'm sure we learned many things about research ethics uh, from this webinar, and uh, we'll quickly get to the questions. We have uh, way too many questions today, and uh, I hope we can get to them all. So, um, starting with the first one, does the absence of standardized research reviews hinder publications? Okay. Should I repeat it? No, no, no. Okay. Um. Uh, So see, I will answer that question in a yes and a no. Uh, uh, both, I, because I think yes, there is. Um, I mean, uh, also that the kinds of uh, research ecosystems that we are in, especially in our uh, higher education, especially in colleges, uh, and also to an extent in traditional universities, uh, are not really geared towards. publication so in that sense uh, you know this sort of a lack of having these uh, you know having the this sort of a infrastructure for standardized review etc definitely hinders and hampers uh, in some ways uh, you know publications uh, but on the other hand i also want to say that um, standardization also has in that sense its own uh sometimes problems right uh, and often therefore if we again if we go back and look at the history of uh, ethics uh, and what has been considered ethical research what has been considered publishable research etc uh, we also know that often research that has tried to produce oppositional knowledges uh, or research that has come from in that sense uh, you know marginalized communities or which in many in in some ways or the other challenges the canonical knowledges uh, has also uh, uh, you know um, suffered uh, from the uh, you know from the gatekeeping mechanisms of disciplines including uh, you know processes like standardized review uh, etc right or or what in that sense uh, constitutes the pros the standardized protocols of publication etc right so i would say uh, my answer to that question therefore is a yes and a no both uh, because i think that while uh, you know having this sort of uh, you know infrastructure uh, would would facilitate in some ways publication uh, i also think that in the context of uh, the larger enterprise of knowledge making uh, standardized mechanisms often also become gatekeeping mechanisms uh, and gatekeeping mechanisms tend to therefore only let knowledge that reproduces existing disciplinary common sense through uh and sometimes therefore gate keeps oppositional uh, sort of knowledges so so yeah i mean yes and no both uh
fast. Nidhi and Priya, you point. need to move faster. You need to move yes. fast, quickly with your questions. Yes, yeah. ma'am. So, yeah. ma'am, the next question is, what is considered as new knowledge? Is it something that was discovered or known, but from a different perspective? What is considered new knowledge? Is that what the question yeah. was? Yeah. Yeah. Is it, uh, is it so yeah, I mean, that I was discovered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. known, but from a different perspective. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I would say that knowledge. There are kinds and kinds of knowledges, right? I mean, there is knowledge in terms of uh, that which is uh, which is not known, which needs to be probed or which needs to be explored. And again, I think a lot of times we think about research necessarily as something uh, that should be about, uh, uh, you know, that should be about finding out something new, right? But I'm saying that even changing uh, the perspective or the framework through which we understand something uh, about which there might be existing knowledge, but even changing the perspective or the framework by which we look at that is also research, right? And let me give you just one very quick example because we are talking about declining child sex ratios, for instance, right? Now, everybody knows that, oh, declining child sex ratios are linked to patriarchy, they are uh, linked to sun preference. Uh, there's so much already existing available knowledge about that, right? I mean, you might also feel what is there to research on declining child sex ratios, right? But for instance, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, a publication like uh, Planning families planning gender for instance uh, what that does is so it's going back to the same question but what because they are taking a different perspective to it where they are not only looking at the availability for instance of whatever uh, technology but also looking at what is happening at the level of the family etc etc they are actually able to show us how it's not just about this age old son preference but about a new kind of phenomenon of daughter aversion or daughter dispreference uh, which is actually linked not to uh, you know some sort of traditional sun preference but actually linked to uh, you know contemporary phenomenon of uh, small family norms um, state control over fertility and uh, you know the kind of mobility that uh, families want right now my point is therefore that this is not researching something that is unknown but it is bringing an entirely new way or uh, of asking questions or understanding a phenomenon about which knowledge exists so i would say that research knowledge new knowledge is therefore not just about something that we don't know uh, but also sometimes about changing frameworks or changing the ways in which we, uh, you know, the interpretive frameworks with which we understand something. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much for that. Coming to the next qu uh, question, under what circumstances do I need to apply for ethical approval for my research papers? Well, uh, see now again in right now in India, this is um, you know it's very uh, it's it's different, right? So uh, universe uh, is, it depends on who your funders are, it depends on uh, who you are writing for, it depends on uh, who you are doing research with. But uh, typically, if you are doing research with human subjects, um, uh, you know, especially in a funded kind of a context, um, uh, then uh, you know, getting approval from ethical uh, ethic committees would be mandatory but i would say that you know whatever research it is that you're doing and even if your uh, college or your university does not have an ethical committee in place uh, it would always be a good idea to have uh, you know, two or three people, one, two, whatever, uh, as your ethics committee, uh, you know, who you take your proposals to, uh, who you actually discuss, uh, you know, your process of research with, etc. Even if it is not mandatory, right? But mostly if you have any sort of uh, funding, especially international funding, and you're working with human subjects, uh, in most of those cases, uh, you know, uh, passing by the ethical committee is mandatory. But I'm saying that uh, having an ethics committee, where whether a formal one or uh, a more informal one, uh, uh, having it is actually good research practice, w whether or not it is mandated by your whatever funding agency or college or whatever. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is, if my research contains animal studies, then is there any ethical policy do we need to follow? Sorry, if your research includes animal study, then is there any ethical policy we need to follow it? Yes, for animal research also there is uh, there are sets of 
uh, you know, ethical guidelines in terms of, uh, you know, how do you treat animals for whatever. And there's actually a very big conversation right now uh, about especially the use of animals in pharmaceutical research, in, uh, you know, beauty research, so on and so forth. So, uh, again, right, I mean, uh, uh, and especially I think with, with animal subjects now, uh, you know, how you can house them, where you can keep them, how which kinds of animal resources you can uh, use, all of this actually. Uh, so you will have to, again, look at what are, what is mandated within your particular uh, thing. But yes, there are very much ethical, uh, you know, uh, guidelines and frameworks for even doing research with uh, animals. So when I said human subjects, I meant uh, as against, uh, you know, archival or other kind of research. Uh, but yeah, if you're working with any kinds of living organisms, there would be uh, ethical considerations there, even if it's animals who might not be able to speak back, so to say to you. Um, Ma'am, the next question is from Forum. She asks, how did research ethics come into being? Uh, how can one uh, have the authority to define what is a research ethic and what is not? So, uh, for I don't have, I wish I had the time actually uh, to go into actually the history of how, you know, how research ethics uh, sort of came about. And it's a very, very fascinating, uh, you know, sort of history. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, and a very disturbing history as well. Uh, all I can say is how it has come about is because uh, of extremely disturbing ways, uh, very, very violent ways in which, uh, you know, human beings have carried out research with human beings uh, including for instance the kind of bi you know uh, biological research that happened uh, on uh, say prisoners in concentration camps in Nazi Germany uh, you know to very very controversial uh, you know um, uh, experiments with human subjects in the United States uh, for instance uh, to try and bring about behavioral changes uh, or you know to try and experimentally check out this nature versus nurture debate etc right so um, uh, in fact it has I mean all I can say is that it's a very I mean we can have a whole session on how did uh, you yeah. know research ethics the come Hippocratic about it's a very oath, the Hippocratic oath 10 commandments we can begin from there and we can come exactly all the so way. I mean there's a whole long history I don't think we have the time to go yeah. into that history but uh, suffice to say, it has come from actually uh, very disturbing historical events of the ways in which human beings have treated other human beings. Uh, and, uh, you know, learning in that sense from those uh, to uh, regulate the ways in which we uh, do work with other human beings. I mean, that's the short uh, sort of answer uh, to that. But but there's a long, uh, you know, history. I mean, even if we are not to look at the, uh, you know, the ancient theological, whatever, even in modern terms, uh, not how it has, uh, how it has uh, developed. And therefore, I mean, there is no one singular way of saying uh, what is good, what is bad. What is clear very much is that any research that harms participants is unethical research. Uh, but beyond uh, that, you know, how do you negotiate these questions of agency, of voice, uh, or, you know, of, of in that sense, uh, further marginalization. Uh, what are the strategies to do that is really, I mean, there is no single answer uh, to that, right? Because as we saw, it is extremely contextual. Uh, and therefore, as every researcher can only learn from what others have done uh, and negotiate that, uh, you know, in their own practice. And therefore, research is ethical practice is an everyday thing. It's not a set of commandments that you can keep uh, you know, and say, oh, this is, uh, uh, you know, this is what I'm going to learn from. You have to constantly, because every day when you go out into the field to do research, you are going to be faced with ethical questions and to think of them as intrinsic and inherent part of research, I think is the only way to, uh, to deal with, uh, you know, these questions of uh, what is ethical. The session has got quite stretched. Priya, how many questions are there now? Last two questions. Last two questions. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so, ma'am, the next question is by Anshita Saxena. She is asking, like, what kind of research are considered as unethical? Is there any example still date? I just gave you an example of what is clearly unethical research, right? I mean, any see any research that brings about uh, harm, physical or otherwise, or uh, to its participants is unethical research. Can go for next question, maybe. Uh, yeah. Ma'am, I'd just like to conclude this with the very last question. Um, so, uh, Arsalan asks if some content we have is not known to the public but still might be somewhere and we publish it, 
what are the chances that the content we publish is plagiarized see i mean the point is that in the world that we live in where everything so much is available at the click of a button the possibility that something that you write uh, will get plagiarized always uh, exists uh, right because i mean if it's out there in the public domain uh, and and i mean uh, the, the possibility that somebody in that sense is copy pasting it or using it always uh, exists what we can hope for is that more and more people become a part of the conversation on what constitutes in that sense ethical uh, research practice and practice uh ethical research uh every day but i mean beyond that i don't know what how to answer that question okay ma'am with that we come to the very end of our question and answer session so thank you so much for giving us your time and for answering all of the questions here thank you um i think we will move on to the quiz now uh, no, the uh, quiz will be after, after you know the vote of no, thanks uh, let us hand over to now mm -hmm. thank you very much ma'am for that wonderful session mm -hmm. and uh, very well uh, i know research ethics is you know when you talk like it's it's a very vast you can we can go for entire fdp on every research ethics. Mm -hmm. yeah right mm -hmm. so but still you gave a wonderful uh, it's wonderful talk on this such a short span of time so now i'll request priya to just propose thanks photo yes priya Thank you, Sangeeta, ma'am. It's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks. I, Priya Shrivastava, on behalf of this esteemed GHC research hub, extend my sincere thanks to our college, faculties, and students for making this event a success. On behalf of our college, we would like to express our gratitude to our speaker of the day, Sneha, ma'am, who has spared her precious time for us. Thank you so much, ma'am, for accepting our invite to grace this event with your presentation and presence. Now, today we had an opportunity to hear your thoughts regarding research ethics. You truly made this event very enlightening for us. Your deep and intellectual way of imparting knowledge has added glory in our event. Today we have got a very valuable information which will truly help us in our research journey. you have given us a deep insight into the topic and has revealed some interesting ethics that we all need to keep in mind while writing any research proposal so like by explaining us with several examples you taken like fertilization process then difference between uh, so understanding what is morality and ethics then plagiarism references and many others i hope all the participants on youtube as well also have got wonderful insight into the research ethics so now i would like to take all of your attention uh, all your attentions by saying that that uh, follow us on our insta follow us your journey in our research or in uh, follow us your journey in research by following us on your social media on our social media platforms like instagram facebook twitter youtube and linkedin the link will be shared in the chat box and do spread this message everywhere because the research hub of jhc is not only for jain hindite or jain college but it is for everyone outside colleges also so it is the opportunity to learn about the research so grab this opportunity and do spread it don't forget to spread it so soon the registration form for yeah. students and education to join our research hub will be released soon so stay tuned with the message so follow our follow our instagram facebook and all other social platform so uh, and also please don't forget to fill the feedback form which will be shared soon in the uh, chat box in the live chat box of youtube so thank you everyone uh, for making this event a great success also uh, we also i would also take this opportunity to thanks our principal sir who has been our guiding spirit in this matter of research now finally i would uh, like to say thank you so much for making this event wonderful session thank you so much ma'am and to entire audience teachers and entire research hub and entire jain college for organizing this research 
hub event on research ethics i i was truly inspired inspired like you know uh, some of the events like uh, yeah i have also did some research project yeah that like narrow teacher was saying to narrow down the questions that judgmental part i can relate it and it was very really amazing to listen like you know yeah it's very great it's it's a learning thank process you. so thank you so Wonderful. much ma'am thank, thank you thank you thank you thank you i'm glad you all found now it now i'm going to ask ma'am to take the quiz part thank you yeah thank you and priya uh, for so, ma'am we expect your association with jaihin college still yes. nurture in your future absolutely i would be delighted i am going to invite you again no definitely i had come to uh, jaihin 3 4 years back actually uh, when we used to see you online, online. Yes, yeah, we I have done that. some workshops, so I would the love to come back. Now, since yeah. we have started with the offline activities, now we would love to invite you. Definitely, I would love to come. Yes. Sure. Thank you so much, right. Doctor. Thank Singha. you so much. Thank you. And Can thank I you for taking out? out time. Yeah, thank you for taking out time from your. Thank you, ma'am. And no, no, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, participants will please stay on for the quiz. Okay. Uh, so i will be uh, you know uh, taking uh, uh, the questions here uh, i mean questions i will be putting on the chat here on streamyard as well uh, priya and nidhi you can post it on the youtube link okay will you be able to do that uh yes ma'am no. uh, we'll uh, we can just uh, whatever the question you asked we can just type it out and post it yeah or i can put it on the whatsapp group and somebody can put it from there Yes, yeah. ma'am. Uh, we'll take yeah. care of it. Yeah. Yes. So coming on your way is the first question for today. Research ethics is not extraneous to research and involves making judgments at every step. True or false? True or false? So answer this. What is the answer being given? forum will be putting the answers there on the chat forum will be putting okay is this question being answered there yes ma'am uh, we are getting a majority of true okay forum has put the answer uh, there correct the answer is true right okay now the second question is is it uh, strictly unethical to use any animals for research yes or no is it strictly unethical to use any animals for research we are getting true as the answer Some are saying Fiction. false. Some are saying false, right? True yeah. or false? False, false, yeah. Answer is false. Yes. False okay. or majority? Yes. The third question is: Ethics is different from morality. Ethics is different from morality because, and the options are: Ethics do not arise from religion. Number one. number 2 ethics are contextual number 3 ethics are prescribed and standardized norms what is the answer here we are getting false no here you have to choose the option you have to choose the option so i'm putting the question here again on the stream yard so you can put it and also on the whatsapp okay somebody needs to tell the volunteers there to put it on the um, youtube link we see that how many options were there ma'am majority of them are saying one as the option one yeah ethics do not arise from religion uh ma'am i don't remember what is the first option but the majority answer is one and now it is coming to c three Uh, no, they have to place it in the context of the class today or the lecture today. Ma'am, majority saying uh, C or A, either. The answer. Yeah, is that's what. 
they are they are answering both one and three the answer is it is contextual hmm. okay now there is a question which is very simple but you need to locate the word and the context of discovery tries to find out what is the context of discovery context of discovery tries to find out what is dash the answers are what is appropriate what is researchable what is validated which is the question which is the answer what is the answer coming up Yet. It should be researchable. A uh, majority is saying the second option, option two. What is Which, the option? Yeah, researchable. researchable. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's correct. Then. The last question we'll take for today because we already delayed. An explanation of human reproduction through a gender bias in scientific discourse has been criticized by whom? In today's lecture, it was mentioned by the speaker. Does anyone give the name there? Not yet, ma'am. Yes. Does anyone remember? This is the answer. Somebody said grandma. <laughs> okay. So with this, uh, we we'll close and now the Emily, feedback link has yeah. Emily Martin. Yeah, Emily Martin, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Emily Martin. Wow. She explained in the lecture today, no? Yes. That yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so we'll be doing the feedback now. On the chat and then with that we can close right feedback links of children you all, all will post ma'am i have posted i've just now posted the link for feedback oh great this feedback link will be open for 10 minutes kindly note yeah So all the participants keep Evangi, I think your voice what's your audible in between or no, uh, I don't know. Uh, students please ensure that you all fill up the feedback form in case if you have not got it, I will repost the link. Uh ma'am, the link is visible in the chat box. No, but they should be able to open it, no? Yes, ma'am. I checked. It's opening. Oh. Ma'am, I have already ensured that the certificates are also going to be uh, given to them immediately as soon as they submit the feedback forms. So, uh, in case if anybody does not receive the feedback, please ensure that you get back. Second, most important thing is when you are filling the feedback form, ensure that you are writing your email addresses correctly. If you do not enter your email address correctly, you will not receive the certificate. Hmm. Uh, Ma'am, there is one, I believe there is a student called Naruto Susumaki. Uh, Ma'am, can I request him to meet you in person once we reopen in the college? He has a lot of issues and a lot of questions with respect to AAA. So I believe you will have to answer those because they are going on asking those questions here. One minute, Devangi. This is not the platform to answer the queries for people. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And I think we would, whatever the webinars we are conducting, so their main objective is to uh, whatever introduce the concept and learning is the main objective, not the triple. Absolutely, ma'am. Absolutely, ma'am. Right. So shall we uh, call it now, or is it? We're waiting for the form to get done.
you have to keep the meet on the youtube session on for next 5 minutes so that in right. case if they have not accessed the uh, feedback link they will have to do so uh, students who have already filled up the form can leave the meet no problems ma'am thank you thank you so much also sorry bachche social media link yeah social media link yeah you have sent yes yeah on whatsapp it is there yeah then who good job nidhi and priya thank you so much ma'am thank you miss but i was shattered in the middle the other certificates going devangi yes ma'am uh ma'am could you please post the linkedin uh, link again i mean the others have been posted properly nidhi you can do that it's just a copy paste uh ma'am if we post it it gets redacted the channel itself has to post we have tried it last time okay. i'm sorry I'm sorry. Come again. Uh, ma'am, could you please post the LinkedIn uh, link again? Only LinkedIn? Yes, ma'am. Because the other ones are opening just fine, except the LinkedIn one. I'll do that. And before we end the session, thank you very much, Nidhi and Priya, and all the student volunteers who have been excellently involved. in this second session of the research hub and there's a lot of work which goes behind the particular session which we bring in front and even devangi ma'am ma'am has also been you know working through and through though she was not here and really thankful to everybody who has been trying to contribute their best thank you so much ma'am thank you and to sangeeta ma'am thank you ma'am thank you so much we'll the next session on 28th of may right yes ma'am sangeeta ma'am our next session is on 28th yes right so we are opening the registrations so also the soon the number right? of participants were more compared to last time right so one <coughs> yes ma'am last time it One thirty. This time it was, I think, one sixty. One sixty, ma'am. Yes, one sixty. One sixty. One sixty to one eighty. It was fluctuating constantly, ma'am. Hmm. That's right. <coughs> Next webinar, our uh, main focus should be uh, increasing. We are uh, we are still live. Yeah. We are we are yeah. getting us. Ah, hmm. uh, ma'am, may I uh, just close the YouTube link now? Close the YouTube, please.